Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Kupka. I'm a project manager working with the nursing home cohort from Health Insight New Mexico, and I'd like to welcome you to our half hour Hot Topics series. These webinars are designed to provide you great ideas on antipsychotic reduction strategies in a 30 minute time frame to accommodate your busy schedules. They are brought to you by your statewide partnership to improve dementia care work group and sponsored by the New Mexico Department of Health, New Mexico Healthcare Association, and Health Insight. We're very excited about today's presenter. Dr. David R. Scrace is a board certified internist and geriatrician. He is interim chief of general internal medicine and section chief of geriatrics at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Scrace has been involved in the integrated delivery of healthcare services for more than 30 years. As a physician executive for over 20 years, he has held multiple leadership roles in health system, hospital, medical group, health plan, physician hospital organization, and information services settings. He was formerly the president of Presbyterian Health Plan and executive vice president and chief operating officer for Presbyterian Healthcare Services in New Mexico. Dr. Scrace is a professor of internal medicine and geriatrics at UNM and a visiting professor and guest lecturer at numerous academic institutions and medical centers. He previously served as medical director at Bear Canyon Rehabilitation Center and since 2015 has served as consulting medical director to the state of New Mexico Medicaid division. Dr. Scrace was named one of the best doctors in America for 12 consecutive two-year periods from 1996 to 2019 and was selected by his peers as Albuquerque's top doc in geriatric medicine for five consecutive years. He is president of David R. Scrace MD LLC, a consulting company providing services to major healthcare organizations, including the state of New Mexico, and speaks on a wide variety of topics to medical, business, and community groups. Dr. Scrace has authored a book, Practice Makes Perfect, How One Doctor Found the Meaning of Lives, which chronicles some of the lessons he has learned from his most interesting patients. I will now turn things over to Dr. Scrace. Dr. Scrace, you may get started. Well, I'm gonna uh, switch over to share a screen here. Thanks to all of you for coming today especially given the long weekend for some of you anyway coming up. And uh, I'm real excited to come and share with you some things that are happening on a statewide level that I think will be very helpful to all of you in your efforts to improve care in nursing facilities. And I'm gonna go through that. I'm, I'm really pretty flexible about taking questions virtually any time. If you wanna chat them, I'll try to look and see, but I don't think I've got a chat window open, I'll, but I'll, I'll check in from time to time. So um, I'm just going to tell you what's going on <clears throat> with the Medicaid program, with the University of New Mexico, and with Project ECHO with respect to uh, our uh, efforts to improve quality of care in nursing homes. Now, um, these are the topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, I could probably talk for about two and a half hours about these topics, but I've really pared it down to hopefully 20 minutes of time for questions and discussion at the end. I don't know how many of you know it, but in the year 2000, New Mexico ranked number 39th among U.S. states with a population older than 64 of 11.7 percent of our total population. If you look at this graphic, you can see that by 2030, which is actually less than 12 years from now, we'll be ranked number four in the United States. Uh, and if you look at the math, do a little quick math, you'll see we're only going to be 0.7% behind Florida in terms of the number of people 65 and older. When you couple that with the fact that people between 64 and 85 use two to three and a half times the uh, number of services um, of people who are younger, I usually use the term three times, and the use rate for people 85 and above are about six times higher than that younger group. You take that, that level of service utilization, multiply by the growth in our population, we're, we're gonna go up by more than 225% in terms of our number of people over the age of 65. That predicts that we may end up having to expand all of the healthcare services we have in New Mexico by 30 to 45%. And there's some 
people who feel that we will need twice as many nursing home beds as we have now. So we'd have to go from 75 to uh, 150 nursing facilities. And, you know, as I talk to that, I'm not hearing about a lot of people who are going to be building uh, new nursing home buildings in New Mexico at this time. So we're looking at the university and figuring out ways to change the way we deliver care to see if we can do more to help people stay at home. So uh, there really is an urgent need to figure out how are we gonna take care of all these people? And that's part of uh, <clears throat> the impetus for the project that I'm about to share with you now. There are other parts to the project, but I didn't really wanna uh, bore you with all those details and I wanted to focus on the thing that I knew you were all working on today. So um, we're in a $2.1 million effort sponsored by Centennial Care 2, our Medicaid program, um, working with UNM Project ECHO and geriatrics. Uh, we started off earlier this year, we developed a community advisory board. Um, and uh, as you probably know, the Human Services Department, and I put some of their slides in, I'm not gonna read them, just to give you a flavor of this. Um, Centennial Care has three MCOs. It'll be starting to care for Medicaid members in January. Uh, that'll be Blue Cross Blue Shield, Presbyterian, and Western Sky. Molina and uh, um, United Healthcare will no longer be serving the Medicaid population. And so there, and there was a focus on both um, more care coordination, more focus on keeping people at home, uh, trying to make a more robust set of long-term uh, services more focus on care coordination. There's a payment reform uh, arm to this that I'll tell you a little bit about, but this won't be the focus of my um, talk today. They, what you can see here, what they want to do with care coordination is increasing the amount at the provider level. So more is done by the providers and perhaps less by the managed care companies. A big focus on improving transitions of care, and that's something I'm really interested in that also could potentially help us with our antipsychotic use in nursing homes, and then additional programs for high needs populations. So there is a very detailed value-based purchasing arrangement also that will re start rewarding nursing homes for their performance on certain quality metrics, and we just decided which ones those would be last week, and I'm gonna to get to those in just a few minutes. Uh, ECHO is part of this project as well, and we're all on a Zoom conference. It didn't look like too many of you were using your cameras, but typically in ECHO, everyone uses a camera and it's a community of learners that we put together to work on a specific issue. And so, you know, one of the things we met with the Nursing Home Association uh, last year actually was, they said, we don't care what you do, but please don't make us drive anywhere to come to meetings. And so uh, we uh, were gonna honor that request and try to work with people in their own nursing facilities to work on these issues. and. Yeah, has anybody on the call ever been to a Project Echo session or worked with Project Echo, one of the Echo groups? You can just speak. So maybe not. Okay. But in the, in this, in the Echo model, everyone teaches and everyone learns. It isn't just having a bunch of experts in Albuquerque telling people what to do. It's a conversation between all the people, and in this case, all the nursing homes that are trying to solve a particular problem. So our community advisory board convened in March that we described the goal of the project that you can see on your screen, hopefully, to, to improve quality and value of care and reduce avoidable readmissions for all New Mexico Medicaid members receiving services in nursing facilities by 2023. We've actually since changed it, I just noticed it, just say avoidable hospitalizations because we want to focus on long-term care patients, not just skilled nursing patients. The structure of this is as shown, uh, you've got a project leadership group that I'm on and some other folks, and then this community advisory board, which consists of about 20, 25 people, people from Medicaid, there's several people uh, from our quality organization, there are uh, a lot of folks really involved in this, a number of people from our nursing facilities who have a really important voice. Uh, and then there's a value-based purchasing group that's being organized by Medicaid. I also work on that side of this and a provider advisory group that will be um, consist of providers that will help to form the way that we set up 
this value-based purchasing model. And uh, you can see that we're focusing specifically on quality improvement, hospitalization, avoidance, and behavioral health. We're not exactly sure whether behavioral health is gonna be under quality improvement or be its own separate arm just yet. But either way, we're planning on focusing on a metric in behavioral health no matter what else happens. These are the folks in the cab, and you can see there's several people from Medicaid on the group, a number of people from ECHO, a number of people from uh, UNM, and then there are folks from Health Insight New Mexico, Ramona and Shannon, I'm sure you, uh, most of you know them. Uh, we've got folks from a data company in Boston, Point Right, and uh, we're really excited about the group. It's done a lot of great work, and they've defined our metrics, and I'm going to get the get to those right now. So uh, <clears throat> when we had our CAP meetings and we talked to the folks who work in the nursing facilities, they said, please, whatever you do, try to make what we're doing uh, relevant to the kind of citations and the work that we're doing in each of our facilities. And so we were able to get data uh, from Genesis actually about national and New Mexico level citations. And uh, some of these don't exactly uh, allow themselves to be measured according to existing measures. And that, that's another promise we made to the Nursing Home uh, Association. I think they said loud and clear, no new measures. And when we talked to nurse, folks in the nursing facilities, they said no new measures. So, but you'll see here that some of the things that we picked do correlate with some uh, uh, high priority items that are being worked on in our facilities. Uh, we were able to get data here, and, and this is kind of an unusual table, but what we've done is we've taken five years of data uh, for New Mexico on many of the measures that you're familiar with, uh, MDS measures, CASPER measures, and, uh, and the group came up with some criteria for selecting these measures. And then we took the difference between, we took the U.S. value minus the New Mexico average value to see where the gaps were. And so these are ranked in order of gap. And so you can see the biggest gap we have, the place where the United States on average is doing way better than New Mexico is in pneumonia and influenza vaccines. After that, pain in both, and SS here stands for short stay and LS stands for long stay. You may be familiar with those terms, so you may use SNF and long-term care uh, for those. And uh, actually the ones that are in red <coughs> uh, are the ones that we picked. So <coughs> hopefully there'll be some cheering that I can hear from this group because we are intending to focus on long stay and short stay antipsychotic use. Now one thing you'll notice here is that there's been a dramatic improvement, uh, well not a dramatic improvement, but there, you know, we were 19 percent in long stay back in 2013 and we're down to 16 percent so that's a fairly significant drop a short stay uh, also a bit of a drop uh, still a gap between the nation not a big gap but there's a feeling that among the community advisory board among the folks at medicaid and certainly probably many of you that there's a real shortage of behavioral health resources out in the community and so we're wanting to focus on that and see that metric and use that as a platform for discussions about caring for patients. We are going to work on trying to have the incentives that go to nursing homes from this effort of all the measures pay an additional 10 to 20 dollars per resident per day at the highest level. Uh, and again the metrics are, are listed here. There's also a readmission um, metric as well. So there's some money here that will reward people who do find ways to make improvements. So I just wanted to switch over just really quickly because Shannon asked me to talk about this and uh, we started a little late, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly through this, but uh, I spent my whole career mainly working with physicians to improve quality and helping them change their behavior. But I'm really convinced that physicians and other practitioners really want to provide the highest quality of care. They often or, or actually barely have the tools uh, to measure or improve quality on their own. They're really very busy and so they don't have the time to develop these pool, uh, tools. But <clears throat> in general, incentives seem to work to help providers improve and they don't have to be monetary. Sometimes it's just creating a report card so people can see how they're doing. And you know, to get into medical school, you have to have a pretty good report card. And so if you're able to produce report cards for practitioners that show that there are gaps in the quality of their care, they're eager often to improve them. And so 
This is an article, and Shannon, I don't know if you sent it out to everybody. I did send it to Shannon. She can certainly send it out to all of you. Um, this is the model I've used through the years where you first you involve practitioners in agreeing on what the standard of care is. And with the use of antipsychotics, that's a bit of a challenge since Medicare has a rather uh, unusual definition for that that excludes people who are commonly treated with antipsychotics. Uh, and then the next step is you collect and provide initial reporting to uh, practitioners of their data. And then step three is my favorite. That's where we all argue incessantly about the data for a while, but we use those arguments actually and those things that practitioners correctly point out as being gaps in the data to improve the data. And eventually you can provide actionable data. Which I, that I mean giving a provider a report card saying, uh, in this case, the report card would say, said, like, here are your patients by name who are on antipsychotics who don't meet the Medicare criteria. And here are your patients by name who are on antipsychotics who do meet those criteria. And then generally, I found that care improves. Now, you might not have the same experience, but that's been mine. So what I think we have going for us in the state in terms of an additional acceleration to all the great hard work you all have been doing in the nursing facilities is there new incentives, new financial incentives for nursing facilities. There are going to be new incentives for the managed care companies. Uh, there's gonna, uh, we're going to pull together this data uh, <clears throat> through Project ECHO to report and focus on improvements. And uh, so I'm, I'd like to hear from you now, because you're the ones actually doing this work. So far as you've been doing this, what are the main barriers you're experiencing uh, to improvement in this area? And, uh, and then uh, I think I'm just going to stop screen share. Uh, I was gonna, Shannon asked me to share a few comments, and so let me do those, and then we'll come back to the two questions. So number one is, uh, I was a medical director at Bear Canyon for a year and a half, and during that time, we made some process changes. So anybody who came in, for example, on catiapine, 25 milligrams at bedtime, was automatically discontinued. We had a process where when a patient came in on an antipsychotic and there was no documentation of any behavioral health disorder in the chart, uh, we, uh, we, we generally discontinued it if they were on a level or a dose that was sufficient to suggest they had schizophrenia or another major psychiatric disorder, we didn't discontinue it, but we had a concerted effort to reach out. Uh, uh, we also found that uh, through the use of uh, SPAR communication, we dramatically decreased uh, middle of the night nursing calls to practitioners who were on call set about behavioral problems. Because uh, it's hard when you're woken up in the middle of the night and someone is acting out. And, you know, it's, it's easier to um, just prescribe an antipsychotic than it is to walk through all the many steps you need to go through to think about non-medication ways of intervening. And, you know, we were short on psychiatrists there, but we were able to make some arrangements to get some more folks in. So those, I think, are the end of my slides. And uh, I'm going to get, get me out of screen share, and I want to hear from you. What are the challenges you're seeing, and are, do you have any questions for me that I might be able to help you with? So let's give everybody a minute to just chat in some questions that you might have for Dr. Scrace. Um, one thing to perhaps start with, Dr. Scrace, is um, what can facilities do to improve medical director buy-in for reducing antipsychotic medications? Any thoughts on what got your buy-in or what you know from your colleagues? Yeah, no, I would, I would just go back to my diagram. I think we will sometime in the next, uh, in the, in the next six to 12 months be producing a statewide report card that lists every nursing facility and their performance on the use of antipsychotics. And, and I mean, even I have some moderately strong opinions about, you know, the best way to take care of patients in certain situations. But if I find, if someone gives me data that sort of says I'm a major outlier, then that would cause me to rethink. And, and in the past has actually caused me to rethink how I do some things. So um, I think that that diagram I showed, I think, uh, while we don't have the opportunity to get them to buy into the definition of the measure, I think we can uh, work with them, report on their performance, argue with them about the data, improve that data, 
and uh, give them actionable data to show those folks uh, who are receiving the meds in their facilities. I know Genesis uh, has medical director meetings where they actually do this and it seems pretty effective. And it starts um, conversations between you know, people who have 40% of their uh, patients on antipsychotics and the folks who have you know, 9% or 10%. Okay. What other kinds of questions do folks have? Now's your opportunity to either chat this in or you can go ahead and I believe there's a raise hand function that you have the opportunity to click on to be able to have Kelly unmute you. Oh, do, we, do we have central muting in this uh, conference call? We do for purposes of recording it and posting it. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Do people know how to use the raise hand function? Adelina, you can go ahead and ask your question. There we go. Oh, you're, you're muted, Adelina. Go ahead and just unmute yourself on the left side of your screen. Or Kelly, unmute. I found it. There we go. Um, just more, just more understanding. And since I'm new to doing this, uh, the social work, I'm a social work director. Just more, you know, I like to understand from from me that way I can better help my residents. But also, you know, just to know, I I. I like the to have that knowledge, even if I have to go back and look at it. I mean, yeah. it's it's interesting topic, and the more I learn, the better off I'll be. I think one important thing about antipsychotic use in nursing homes is there's a fairly high percentage of people in nursing homes with dementia, and patients yes. with dementia uh, who take antipsychotics have shorter lives than people who don't. So I have a very elaborate set of notes I put in my EMR. Um, uh, you know, when I talk to families about this, I mean, we, I do have families choose that trade-off. Generally, it's families who wanna keep their mom or dad at home. They don't want them to go to a facility and they're willing to trade off six months of life at home against nine or 12 months in a nursing facility. But uh, nonetheless, it's important that we realize that when these patients are on these medicines, it shortens their life. And generally, I don't think we do the best job informing families of that, documenting it in the chart and the like. So I think that's why Medicare and Medicaid feel so strongly that we want to limit it. I think the other thing is, if you notice, the national average is not zero. You know, there are people who don't have Huntington's or Tourette's or schizophrenia for whom it's an appropriate therapeutic choice. First, there's a bunch of uh, diagnoses like uh, bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder where it's indicated and the Medicare measure is just out of date. But then there are other folks uh, where you may have tried all the redirection and other non-pharmacological ways and exercise and music and all those things that we would be talking about in our echo sessions. Uh, we, we would have tried all those and they don't work and then occasionally it is appropriate. But simply continuing every prescription that comes to the hospital is not a good idea and short and does shorten some people's lives. Excuse me, sir. Um, I have a husband that does have Tourette's, but he controls it pretty good. Yeah. And he's a social worker as well. But I also have a daughter that's bipolar and I didn't have bipolar. So I guess it's hereditary uh, through the dad. Uh, he's the one that has Tourette's is my husband now, but the ex-husband had bipolar. I didn't know it at the time the difference between ADHD and bipolar, I just felt, you know, strong about it was more. And I, I didn't know anything about bipolar, but now I do. But uh, now my daughter's 25 and my husband, he's 72. So um, I've gotten more, how would you say it, hand, hand on experience, because that's the way I, I like to learn. And that's the way I learned to get it in my head that, you know, there are things out there like that. And that helps me 
better serve the residents. I get. I will. I don't know if that makes sense to you, sir. No, I mean, I. I think life is just chock full of potential learning moments. Yes. And uh, I used to think there were like the really big ones were once a month or once a year, but now I think there's probably thousands every day. So the more we can learn from our okay. personal experiences, the, uh, you know, the, the more we can grow. Yeah, that's why I went into social work was specifically to learn more and that way I can better help the residents here. That's great. Anybody else have a question or comment or thought? While folks might be thinking of this question, I know Dr. Scrace, you mentioned that there was going to be some type of maybe future dashboard of types so people can see their, their rates in comparison to other prescribers across the state. Are there tips that you can offer to facilities for what they might be able to use now while awaiting a tool like that um, to be developed? Well, um, I think that if, I think many, but not all, nursing homes have MDS coordinators. And uh, those folks should be able to get you the national average and the New Mexico average for the data. It may not be like for that month, but you know, I know Casper reports it out uh, on a pretty real time basis as well. So talk to them and, and look at those reports. I, I spent a year and a half going through Casper reports every month. and. And uh, you can get a pretty good feel of where you are. I can just say right now, I mean, I, uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation and just uh, let, me, uh, let me go to that slide where I showed the metrics all lined up there. But, uh, you know, right now, if you're, you know, long, if you're you know, measuring your long-term antipsychotic use and it's, over 20%, then you're significantly above both the state and the national average. If it's below 10% in long-term care patients, then you're doing a really good job. And uh, part of the purpose of our project is to connect those folks who are doing a really good job to the people who need new ideas. It isn't a bunch of, like I said, uh, myself, the psychiatrist, others in Albuquerque, we're not just gonna be dispensing great wisdom of everything you need to do, but it'll be, it'll be facilities really talking to each other about the things they've tried that worked, the things they've tried that didn't work, um, and getting some help from each other as well. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. David Grace, for his time today and for sharing information about the project and his experience as a medical director. So thank you, Dr. Grace. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Have a great Absolutely. day and a great weekend, everyone. Thank you very much. This concludes our hot topic session for today and have a wonderful weekend.